It's a conspiracy is a proud member of the Alberta Podcast Network. For other fun programming, please check out Alberta Podcast Network dot com where you can find shows like Emily Missed Out. <laughs> Okay, Greg, before we get started here, do you want to address what's going on with your face here? I, you know, not to shame you, but I, I, I feel like we have to bring this out in the open in some way. Well, I didn't remember that, like, you know, if you were going to an interview that you had to wear a mask. So I was like, oh, I should probably look like an upstanding citizen that can do a job and um, then ended up wearing a mask the entire time. and was like, okay, I look like a chubby child with a bald head. <laughs> and now I got to regrow my beard. But there's a, there, I can see it. There's a tan line. Shut up. <laughs> no, I'm just, I just, I haven't, this is, yeah. Oh, there is a tan I'm line. There is, okay. there is a tan line, yeah. So, like, I got some wicked tan over the summer with a beard, and um, when I shaved it, it was, yeah. so I've been hanging outside quite a bit the past few days. Yeah, <laughs> and you grow a beard real fast, right? Like, you're a beard guy. I can grow a beard, yeah, but not a real good one. Like, it takes me a solid couple months to get, a, like, a solid beard. That blows my. You look like a beard guy, man. Like every time I've it's seen you, it's just because my it's, it's it's thick and dark. Okay, well, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we'll just leave it there. We'll just leave it there. Yeah. Oh, uh, welcome back, everyone, to it's conspiracy. This is the podcast where we lay out the beliefs behind uh, select conspiracy theories, alternative accounts, legends, myths, and more. I'm your host, Andrew, and I do not claim to be an expert on anything. We're going to discuss today, and we'll probably be wrong about everything as usual, because I went to the zoo today and saw, amongst other things, an elephant, three zebras, and a red panda. Have you guys ever seen a red panda before? Uh, yeah, amazing. Never. At the Edmonton Zoo? When they attack, when they go into t- attack formation and they, like, stand up on their tiny... Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, they look big. This guy was snoozing in the tree. He was in the opposite of attack formation. He was in, like, lounge. It was amazing. They were very friendly, but it was very hot today, very uncomfortable. And I even saw there's a baby lynx. Aww. So a little tiny lynx. And uh, someone said, you've got to be kitten me right meow. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, that's gold. Also, there was three zebras. And the sign was like, we've got two, two females and a male. And my wife's like, well, how do you know? And I'm like, well, those are the shebras and the hebras over there. And she's like, that's, that's <laughs> not what they're called. I'm like, no, that's not what they're called. But... Okay. Anyways, I thought it was funny. Uh, If you'd like to see whatever prime cuts of sinew we're going to discuss today, then please zip by the resources in the episode description. Charlie humanely butchers those peaceful creatures in attack position on Tuesday evenings, and we appreciate his efforts. Uh, Thank you on behalf of the animals. Hey, man. Uh, Lastly, we are are proud. Did you get a picture of the lynx? I didn't get a picture of the lynx, no. Well, if you go to get a picture of the lynx, we could have put a picture of the lynx in the lynx, so you could enjoy the lynx with your lynx. The lynx in the lynx. The links, links in the links. I'll see if I can get a picture from the Edmonton Zoo for the links. The links, links. I we're a Alberta <laughs> Podcast Network. Yay! Okay, um, you can check us out online at our website. It's conspiracypodcast.com. Our Twitter at Is It a Conspiracy? That's run by the Irish Madman. Our Facebook group, the Instagram, It's a Conspiracy Podcast. That's run by Gorgeous Greg. Our email and our Patreon page, patreoncom slash It's a Conspiracy. <laughs> Okay. That was, <laughs> that's how he I love that here. effect. That effect yeah. is so awesome. Joining the online distance communication time today is Charming Charlie and Gorgeous right. Greg. These friends will interject as they see fit. And I do appreciate their digital distance company. And I'm really glad that we can, again, do this as a team. It was nice having the ladies with us last time for our Cinema Spiracy episode. But it's nice to just have the uh, the three amigos back for some enchiladas. Okay. Uh, <laughs> ready then, Charlie, with a yes or no, can you tell me if you've heard of any of these fun theories? Let's do it. Um, number one, 10 fun facts about lunch meat. Yum. Yeah. Uh, number two, hot dog secrets. Oh, boy. Number three, the spam mystery. Zowie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm not sure if these are yeses or noes. And uh, number four, whatever Charlie's going to talk about. Oh my God, I'm go- I got a monster of the week for y'all. You a monster, to- a lunch monster, a, a monster of the week. It's okay, delicious. want to know okay. about it? Nope. Let's let's leave it at that. You got a you got a a, a monster. Okay. Monster of the week. And Greg, what are you going to share with us in a thesis statement? Uh, we are going to talk about head cheese. Oh my. 
Mm. Yeah, My favorite and it, of the it, it's not as gross as it sounds. Hail to the head cheese. Okay. See, if we were all together, we could be like, here's some head cheese. Let's try it out, then let's learn about it. You know? Unfortunately, get- I'm going to be eating all the head cheese, and I'll let you guys know about it. Oh, have you got some with you? you got no, some? I can wish, oh. though. <laughs> uh, okay, so here is subject number one. Oh, and, and that order is not going to be the order that this comes out in, but we'll, we'll sort that out. out. Here's subject number one. Ten fun facts about lunch meat. Bart, what's wrong? My baboon heart. Buddy, rejecting it. <laughs> lunch meat, luncheon meat. Meat of the luncheon, snack meat, cold cuts, cold meats, cut meats, sandwich meats, cooked meats, sliced meats, uh, deli meats, deli lunch meats, deli cut meats, deli meat meats. There's a number of terms for essentially the same thing. Oh, I was going to say, are those all your facts? No, no, that's it. (laughs) And we're done. (laughs) Those are meats that have been cooked or cured that are often sausages. That's Charlie's favorite. Or loaves. That's Greg's favorite. Mm. These are often sliced and served hot or cold. With accompaniments like a sandwich or just straight up like a cocktail weenie. And you can put that meat on a meat platter for only $90. Okay? Act now. Uh, Number one, (laughs) March 3rd is National Cold Cut Day in the U.S. I don't know if it is in Canada or not, but I wish we had a day. It is cold in March, so. We'll adopt it. Yeah, Yeah, sure. Cold Cut Day. Cold Cut Day. This one took me by surprise. Number two, at Subway, if you order anything with a cold cut and i'm doing the finger quotes cold cut you are getting turkey even if it doesn't look like turkey smell or taste like turkey that's turkey anything called a cold cut at subway that's turkey wait so the cold cut trio is turkey turkey and turkey that's turkey 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 yep the cold cut combo that's turkey cold cut salad turkey i don't know cold cut salad yeah that's a thing you can get any sub as a salad Um, and they toast it for you Come on. They toast the salad? Make it your way or whatever it is. (laughs) Um, The, sorry, number three, (laughs) due to the size of exposed surfaces, volume of cooking, and expectations for freshness, a number of preservatives have been invented specifically for meats of the luncheon variety. Number four, this desire to keep things preserved is where we got the blessed recipe for pastrami. No, that's not a pasta. Uh, pastrami is not just a fun word to say. It does not require refrigeration, although you should definitely keep it in the fridge if you buy it. Okay, so the recipe is easy. Uh, you get yourself a big beef brisket. You soak mm-hmm. it in brine. This technically makes it a corned beef, although there's no corn. And then you smoke that bad boy. Bam, you got some pastrami. And again, it's not a pasta, even though it sounds like a pasta, right? So that's uh, that's how you make that's how you make the pastrami. And I think it comes from England, so it's not Italian. Yeah, I was going to say, man. <laughs> <laughs> a pastrami. It's the wrong accent, uh, but I like it. So, number five, dolphin meat. Uh-oh. Uh, this is fairly problematic in this day and age, but surprisingly still stays on a semi-regular diet in a few countries around the world, including Japan and Peru. The meat itself is very thick, a deep dark red, almost black, And the muscles are separated by very thick layers of fat. Mm. Uh, On top of the food being from an endangered species, the texture is said to be akin to beef liver and extremely high in mercury. So if you eat it, you will probably have a bad flavor and texture and you'll die from the mercury like you should for eating a dolphin. Hooray! Hooray! Yeah, (laughs) don't eat dolphins. Don't eat dolphins, yeah. Unless you do it by accident, but don't. Um, Coming in a tuna can near you. (laughs) <laughs> number six as of 2004 canada was one of the few countries in the world still exporting seal meat they claim to be selling the meat to asian countries uh in particular taiwan and south korea for pet food but the canadian sellers uh, sorry the canadian sealers association uh they have an article on their homepage uh explaining the legalities around the human consumption of seal meat so they're like Welcome to our webpage. Here's a big expose on human consumption of seal meat. So it's quite a quiet trade in Canada that sells to markets around the world. And personally, that doesn't get my seal of approval. In fact, that might be the sealiest thing I've heard all day. (laughs) You really are just clubbing these jokes out of the (laughs) refrain center. Uh, uh, all right, guys. See you next time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know. Actually, Greg, you probably heard of this before. So, have uh, Charlie? Have you ever tried a Mick Lobster? No. Okay. Uh, so, a, 
Oh, that's right. You're you're deathly allergic. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. why don't you rub it in his face a little bit more? Oh, sorry please, about that, no, Charlie. Please don't rub it in my talk. face. <laughs> we can talk about it, though, right? <laughs> like, if I mention lobster, you're not going to have some kind of reaction? <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> no, just jokes. It's fine. Oh, 911. <laughs> Okay, yeah. So if, you, if you've if you been to eastern Canada or the eastern United States, there's something called a McLobster Roll, uh, and you get it at McDonald's. And it's the McDonald's version of the East Coast Classic Lobster Roll, and it's gone from being like blue-collar construction worker lunch to a delicacy in like fancy restaurants, and then like kind of full circle back to being a McDonald's item. And I don't know why, but lobster on a sandwich for lunch continues to feel strange to me. So are you a lobster roll guy, Greg? I am. <clears throat> I yeah. love lobster. And it's funny that you bring up a little bit of history of lobster. Uh, growing up in the East Coast, like lobster was a poor person's food. For sure. The, the reason being because you could walk up to the ocean and when the tide goes out, whatever lobster's there, that's what your family's eating. So I like I had a neighbor who basically told me a story. He's like, I went to school with a lobster sandwich and I didn't eat that day because he threw it away because he didn't want people to know how poor he was. No. Oh. That's, because all they had to eat was lobster. Because all they had to eat was lobster. Like they, like obviously his family worked and whatever. They just didn't have the money for food. Yeah. So it's so funny to see like that, like a peasant food just becomes like the most um, put it on a pedestal. People are willing to pay ten thousand dollars for whatever. And yeah, 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 you know, back like fifty years ago, people were literally like, "This is all we have to eat today." Yeah. Yeah. So that's wild, man. That would have been yeah, terrible man. for me. You're not a lobster guy. Oh yeah, no, you you would have not done well. <laughs> yeah. Would have died probably, or eaten grass. It's just that five G that gives you all that stuff, man. Don't worry about it. That's right. Yeah, you don't have to worry about it. And Charlie, enough with your allergies, okay? <laughs> you don't have to be you don't it. have to be shellfish and keep bringing it up all the time. Ah <laughs> uh, yes, there. It is. <laughs> can you guys hear? Can you guys hear this? Bologna, Bologna. Did you guys hear that? <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's the Italian version of Dietlov. A Bologna. A Bologna. Yeah. Bologna. And it's hard to it's hard to hear, but there is like a subtle ah right before it. A Bologna. A Bologna. And, he, and he's clearly got his hand up in that Oh Galana Motte Bene, you know. That's a nice playground, huh? It's a good meat. Uh, so yeah, let's let's grab this one more time here. This is how you say uh, well I'll just say, this is the Italian pronunciation of the word. Bologna. Bologna. <laughs> okay. So I've always wondered how to say bologna in a bologna in Italian. <laughs> yeah, and you got to have your hand up. It's not just a bologna. Not, yeah, a bologna. So Come nice on, a bologna. Oh, let me hear the music, can you? Yeah. Um, okay, now it has been a sandwich staple in North America for a very long time, and there are even written poems from the late nineteenth century that infer the word a bologna. Now the odd thing is, it came over as baloney and nobody really knows how this happened for example this bit of lewd burlesque poetry from 1857 uh will demonstrate a couple things here so just a quick disclaimer uh mom if you're listening please just fast forward a couple seconds because things are going to get real raunchy like gold rush style and i don't want to subject you to this okay (laughs) so here is some burlesque poetry from 1857 okay here we go I trust you all with joy ourselves and keep sober. Santa Claus visited several of the rising generation of this generation and left the peanuts, bologna sausage, and other good tings. Anti-cuff hamacopper stocking, but one on the board of health happened to smell a rat, ordered it down, else there's no one have might been to do it with. Okay, so there's a bit of burlesque poetry. Kind of a hard thing to understand what's going on there, but... And also just filthy. I should go scrub out my mouth with soap right now. Um, Break it down. What, what's the filthy parts? Can you uh, just... Uh, I, yeah, yeah, I I couldn't even <laughs> tell you. All I know is that's a that's an example of burlesque poetry. We were just talking about meat. And there's a reference to Santa Claus. Yeah. And, and the reason I mentioned is because there's... He left peanuts, bologna sausage, and other good tings. Okay, so now the reason that this is uh, the reason that this is important is because the whole passage is written down phonetically. Uh, there's a link in the episode description, and you can see that the word baloney is pronounced at least by that author as baloney, like B A L, like it ends with a it ends with a Y kind of sound. So it didn't come over to North America as a bologna, at least by the 1850s it had turned into baloney. So the common thought is that the anglicized version of all things Italian, like Italia, Sicilia, Lombardia, ended up with a Y sound at the end, and a Bologna was no exception. So we turn it into Italy, Sicily, uh, Lombardy. Bologna is typically served in slices, 
or in chunks, which are often fried, which kind of sounds nasty, but that's amazing. Can we all agree on that? Newfie like, steak, baby. Oh. <laughs> and I love this so much. The full piece is not technically called a sausage. Greg, do you know the, the term for a uh, full link of bologna? I'm afraid not, unfortunately. Okay, it's a chub. The technical <laughs> okay, term then, is... Yeah, okay, I did know this then. Yeah. Chub. <laughs> yeah. I only got so, a half one. Yeah. <laughs> I'll get a half chub. The store, get a half um, chub bologna. <laughs> <laughs> dude could you imagine going to like safeway and saying to that poor deli person just like i get a half chub of that and then just be like get the hell out of here oh yeah that's when you're like <laughs> and all went wrong from there yeah he says i beg your pardon, <laughs> pardon. <laughs> <laughs> so uh if you want to prepare if you want to impress the proprietor at your favorite delicatessen next time you're in then simply say, begging your pardon, sir, may you please grant me a chub of your finest a bologna. Bologna. A bologna. Love it. Okay, number nine. And there are actually ten this week, Charlie. Thank you. Number According 10. to Veganista, the best vegan lunch meats available are tofurkey smoked ham, tofurkey peppered, thinly sliced smoked tomato. I don't know a single person that would be like, is this tomato or ham? Uh, hickory smoked tofurkey, smoked field mushrooms. Again, I don't think anyone's mistaking those for lunch meats. And uh, the ever famous not dogs. And uh, anytime I hear those, I'm like, are they not dogs or are these not dogs but something else? Which well, is like dogs in a pretzel shape. <laughs> That's kind of what I was thinking. Yeah, <laughs> not dogs, <laughs> not dogs. An interesting one common Write observation on tofurkey is apparently it tastes just like beef tongue. So. Maybe it actually is. Yeah. Have you guys I had... would like to I would like to meet a vegan that knows what beef tongue tastes like. Well it tastes you. <laughs> the tongue. Oh! Yeah. What does it taste like when it's tasting me? Okay, now it's Never there's actually ten this time. So our fun fact is uh Charlie's favorite lunch meat is bologna followed by a Genoa salami. A Genoa salami. And then uh Greg's was also bologna followed by did you have a followed by? Um, Montreal by smoked meat. Montreal smoked meat, which okay. is like salami, but or not salami, pastrami, but better. Now, a pastrami. And you got a little something extra bonus for you here. Oh, since oh, you yeah. reminded me, since you were we were talking about bologna, you're like, what's your favorite lunch meat? And I was like, oh, you know what? I remember slow fry bologna, and I remember my my love affair with slow fry bologna so much that back in the day, I even wrote a song about it. You wrote Are a serious? song. Serious. I even wrote a song about it. Oh, would you like to share it with us? I'll share that with you right now. <laughs> chunk of it for you a good half chub of slow fry bologna oh well, that man. was that was more than a half chub. itunes yeah, immediately just... <laughs> back in the day that, that, back in the day i felt about that the slow fried bologna song fried bologna. man that was put it back in the set was that album like entirely luncheon meat or just just bologna nope, just that one just that just one, that one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah it was our lunch break you write what you know you write what you know that's right you're right about what you care about that's oh that's so true 
<laughs> um, that was beautiful, by the way. That was very beautiful. I'm very touched. Thank you for sharing that with us, Charlie. That was very nice. Uh, my personal favorite luncheon meat is uh, smoked turkey. Yep. Yeah, that's a good one. That's, that's nothing awesome. wrong with that. No, nothing wrong at all. What's your number two? My number two? Yeah. My number two is baloney. <laughs> <laughs> I just didn't want to be like baloney, baloney, baloney. I know that's a Canadian yeah, stereotype. But we're like, all about baloney, nothing, but it's so good. Like nothing beats like a like white bread, mayonnaise, like some cheddar and mustard, a couple slices of baloney. Yeah, pretty good. Oh, that, that whole sandwich sounds white bread. Yeah. <laughs> Without this tan, that's what I am. <laughs> uh, okay, well then we're going to go to our second subject here, which is Charlie's lunch meat special rodeo slam down something about sandwiches. The monster of the week? The monster of the week. Is that what you're telling me? Is that what mm-hmm. it's for? I got confused there for a second. I was like, slam down? I got to do some. No, I, I went and I had to dig I had to dig deep to find myself a uh, a meat monster of sorts, and I got one. And this, okay. this monster is the fang creature, the meat monster. <clears throat> the fang creature. In Chinese mythology and folklore, the fang creature, which translates to to raise a mound, was an edible monster that resembles a two-eyed lump of meat <clears throat> and magically grows back as fast as it's eaten. Ugh. The Chinese texts also refer to this legendary food with many different names, all of which I will pronounce incorrectly <laughs> Ro, rosy taizu ru rulizing no let me try that one again rulingzi is the modern name popularized by chinese news media reporting on newer discoveries of the fang creature throughout china including a widely publicized xian television report that we'll get back to in a little while shiru is the earliest known name for the fang creature recorded in the first century where it's described in the Chinese classic as a mass of flesh which looks like the liver of an ox. It has two eyes. Even though you eat it, it never is really consumed because it grows again and is born again in the same form as it was before. You can just keep eating it and eating it as much as your little muffin hearts can handle. A utopian morsel of a never-ending supply of meat. Yum. (laughs) This sounds like a dream that I had and my arm was made of bacon. And I just <clears throat> kept eating it and it kept, kept coming back. Like, Another this account. does not sound like a monster. <laughs> it's a monster. No, it's more of a creature, really. It's more of a creature. It sounds like an angel. Another account says, It's a lump of meat in the shape of an ox liver. There are two eyes in it. It can be eaten as food. More of them can be found. Such things are called feng and are edible. People do not know this. Charles, my old rum tugger. How are you doing, lad? Good, good. Um... Just a bit about your accent. I remember once stumbling into a brothel in uh, Kennebunkport, Maine, and met a man who had just had a severe head injury. Also, he was born with two tongues. It seemed that his accent was 20 times better than yours. So, anyway, Chaz, old chum, old bud, um, get your ducks in a row, or feck off. Neo Confucian teacher Xu Ji reportedly found a fang in Lu Zhu once. It is, he said, it is said that Mr. Oh, damn. Let me try that one again. (laughs) So many names. Don't edit it out. Don't leave it in. Neo Confucian teacher Xu Ji reportedly found a fang in Lu Zhu once. It is said that Mr. Xu Ji once picked up a small baby at the riverside in Lu Zhu. There were no fingers on its hands, and there was no blood in his body. He was afraid of it, and he buried it in the ground. This (laughs) this was actually Fang, as recorded in the book Bayes 2. Eating such a thing will increase one's physical strength. It's thought that these findings might be referring to organisms such as sea cucumbers or anemones, to which were accredited supernatural qualities based on the idea that they were spiritual beings. For 2,000 years, the fang creature, with all its many names, has been an obscure aspect of Chinese mythology. But in the late 20th century, Chinese media began reporting a series of faux fang findings. Most of the alleged fang findings have been restricted to Chinese language sources, often with extraordinary pictures, conveniently, none of which I could find in my dark web Google searches. Mm. Now, here's the big finale. One Fang story received international attention in June 2012. Xian Television reported that villagers digging a well had found a ruling Z, which was being kept in a bucket of water. The reporter who was handling the object described it as a fleshy monster with a mouth and a nose. 
However, clever viewers soon identified it as a fleshlight sex toy with a Oof. vagina and an anus. The story became an internet okay. meme in China, and the station issued an apology. Even though I couldn't find pictures of what the thing looked like, I have found the Chinese news report. Just to clarify, this wasn't one of your dark web searches. <laughs> this was just a good old <laughs> YouTube. Right on the YouTube. Oh, damn it. Uh Back to you, Andy. <laughs> the headline, the headline says it all right there. Like that. We'll have oh, a link in man. <clears throat> and that's quite the slip up. Like, oop, oh, oopsie <laughs> <laughs> sure. You bean. know what? And I gotta, I gotta say, I, I didn't do, I didn't do it because I found this instead. But my backup idea was Monster Energy Ham. Ooh. Oh, okay. The monster of that's, the week of Monster Energy Ham. Maybe we'll I thought you were gonna go maybe Rum Ham. <laughs> that sounds like that, that sounds like Gatorade, but like ham that's, that you that's, eat and you get like you're too if, you, if you need a burst of energy and you just you just don't want any liquids, you grab a slice of Monster Energy Ham you and you just all the power you need from like, Monster. I don't energy need to break. sleep. I'm full of yeah. give me ham. ham. You know, energy. <laughs> I'm gonna go in the Stanley Cup. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, I guess that's gonna take us to uh, Charlie. What what are we what are we drinking here? What are we drinking? What are we drinking? I, well, I don't know about you guys, but I'm drinking a good old fashioned old style Pilsner beer. Yes, sir. <laughs> oh, it's delicious, nutritious. Uh, I love when from, people just say left like, old style. Old, well, that's what it says on it. Because if you say Pilsner, and people right get here. like, wow, a lot of beers are Pilsner. Yeah, but this is just known as Pilsner. This like, is, get yeah. it, you know, get it, get your, get it together, people. Mm hmm. So, Charlie, are you from Saskatchewan? <laughs> <laughs> just, I'm just, just a little joke. We have fun here. Okay. Uh, but you, what are you drinking? I've got, a, I've got a can of the, it's from uh, the Grain Bin Brewing Company in Grand Prairie, Alberta, which is where I grew up, and I just really like that city. And they have a brewery that. there that's done some really, really good stuff. And my friend, he has a company there called Image Design. I know this is going to be backwards, but Image Design. And isn't that a snappy looking? Look at that can. Look at that. I like it. So they, they, did a, they did a small run for them. Image Design did the label. And Grain Bin did the, the beer. And it's just my, my buddy gave me a couple of these. We were camping this last weekend. And I'm like, man, just a good looking can. Point good out. beer. All, all, the, all the boxes were ticked off in my little like, yep, yep, check, check, yep. check. And it's fancy. It's kind called Code it? Blue. What kind of a beer is it? I don't know. It's uh, it's probably an IPA. <laughs> it's not an IPA. <laughs> it just says Code Blue. And it says in the bottom corner, it says Hard Seltzer. But I don't think that's a type of beer, right? Hard Seltzer. So uh, Is it more like a... Um, it's a light brown, like akin to like a Newcastle. And it was okay. really, really nice. And I just... The big points were for the uh, the color and the design of the can. Very nice. I like it. It's real nice. Yeah. Hey, Greg, what, have you, uh, what are you slugging away at there? Uh, I'm drinking some Adobe Reserva Organic uh, Rosé. Yeah, oh, Rosé! Yeah, I, I kind of got tired of like the brandy and <clears throat> beer for the summer, and kind of jumped onto the uh, sparkling white wines and uh, pink wines and even orange wines. Now so. that's funny. What is it about Rosé? I I had I knew it existed, but just lately it's come up a couple of times. We were talking about it on Learning to Listen podcast about how how uh, Bon Jovi <laughs> has his own Rosé company. Hmm. Really? Yeah. So, what's up with Rosé's, guys? Um, I, I, I couldn't tell you. I'm not going to lie. I uh, it, The price point was there, and it was cold, and it was a hot day. So, yeah. It is delicious, though. That's all you need. Uh, well, that's going to take us to subject number three. Um, hot dog secrets. Hot dog secrets. Hot dog! Don't know what's inside of you. Hot dog! <laughs> okay, now this does sound like a, a film, like maybe an 80s buddy cop or something like that, like <laughs> Hot Dog Secrets. Um, no, no, I think of it more as like a Taxi Cab Confessions. <laughs> <laughs> what are hot dogs made out of? Uh, well, according to Andrew Zimmern, 
who owns his own line of hot dogs. And he's like, I prefer the term Franks, but all hot dogs will do. And it's like right there. I was like, okay, like settle her down big time, buddy. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so he, he said we're allowed to say hot dogs. So hot dogs it is. Hot they dog. are mostly made out of poultry trimmings, uh, which the USDA defines as a paste or batter-like poultry product. Mm. Batter up. Uh, yep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, mechanically separated turkey or chicken, water, corn syrup, and the delectable sounding starch filler. So Zimmer is quick to point out that the urban legend, uh, and we're all familiar with it, I apologize for the crude language, but, uh, well, hot dogs are lips and assholes. That's not quite true, as those belong to parts of the animal that, ironically, are considered prime or premium cuts. So usually those parts will go into the making and like the butchering process of prime and premium cuts. Sure. The fillings and slurry blend are edible bits that are left after everything else has been taken. So the quote here is, uh, after every edible thing is forced off the bone of those poultry parts, the tissue is ground up and mixed with the other ingredients until it becomes a gloopy puree, which... Mmm, puree. <laughs> gloopy. I look forward to puree. Yummy. That's what uh, I'm looking for. It's gloopy, right? Extra it's important. Gloopy. It's important to note here that if the package says all beef or all chicken or all tongue, then it's from that animal or that part. But according to Zimmern, the standard hot dog ingredients are still never going to contain anything from the premium or prime cuts. So even if they're like, it's all beef, you're still not going to get the good parts of the no. Of the beef, whatever the beefs is. Now, the gloopy puree, mmm, that gets stuffed into a synthetic collagen casing along with starch filler, corn syrup, and water, and then run through a smoke shower. Zimmern is very clear. If you like hot dogs, but you're concerned about the ingredients or process, then just simply read the label. If there's a huge amount of preservatives, hormones, antibiotics in there, or super high levels of sodium, then simply choose something else. It's never going to be the go-to healthy superfood, uh, but there are healthier options available if you look around. Like there's, you know, you go to your the hot dog counter of your favorite store, and there's going to be a couple of options there for you. Zimmern also makes the point that a number of vegan options simply substitute soy products for the meat ingredients, and then they claim themselves to be the healthiest choice while simultaneously having high nitrite, nitrate, sodium, and preservative levels. Uh, so his quote here was, don't be fooled, alternative plant-based preservatives can be just as harmful. We're seeing more and more products for natural-based nitrites, like celery juice or beet juice. It's something to look for in the ingredients. So take away, the takeaway point is this, hot dogs, whether you're a herbivore or a carnivore, you'll, it's never going to be the best thing for your diet. But if you're an adult and you read the labels and you know the risks and you still want to have one, then go ahead and go ahead and hog down on a wiener. That's what I say, right? Get it in you. Dog yeah, up. Slap that in the bun. <clears throat> yep. are you guys, uh, are you guys, ketchup or mustard guys? Oh, I'm a mustard guy personally. All right. Great. I'm going to be judged by this by the whole world if I tell this out loud. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. Uh, mayo, mustard, and ketchup. Hey, that's all right. Yeah. It's it's the most like a Ameri- yeah I can see Andrew right there is like the- yeah I'm not a mayo I'm a hot dog guy but that's okay I'll mayo up I'll mayo yeah, up but see like okay people that eat uh, French fries with mayo yeah. that that bothers the shit out of me uh, that's like, I, I don't get it either that's so a- I'm gonna eat my hot dogs bowl. with mayo and I'm gonna enjoy it I'm okay with that if you were like I'm gonna put a little mayo on my pancakes I'd be like Greg no I thought you were <laughs> gonna we gotta say- talk to you about something <laughs> but I thought you were gonna say just ketchup oh no, that is that's- unacceptable I, ideally ideally like i want some like mayo sauerkraut mustard yeah. and onion I, I could do without the ketchup but uh, i could just do, go all like, mustard yeah mm-hmm. uh, straight up mustard boom you're, you're blowing it but, yeah but, are you, if, get my, <laughs> but if it's a good hot dog sometimes i'm like i just want a bun and the hot dog that's it i don't want anything else in there i just want that's to taste fair. it but yeah, yeah but you said it's got to be that like that hot dog you know yeah. yeah good one but then you go to like i was in munich with my wife and they're like hey let's have a hot dog and, and like i turned around and I didn't realize she meant by saying hot dog it was like a baseball bat and like a tiny little bun. I'm like, that's no longer a hot dog. Like, that's a meat whip. Like, let's have a meat whip. Let's go meat whip each other. Because I'm like, I can't. 
I can float in the pool with this thing. Yeah, I don't believe so. <laughs> it felt like Indiana Jones. So, Did anyways, you your feelings? Yeah, no, it didn't. It wasn't. It wasn't. That. It was just like <laughs> that's a real big hot dog. Okay, mm. that's gonna take us to ad number one. Hot dog. <laughs> This episode is brought to you by Park Power, a provider of electricity and natural gas in Alberta that offers low rates, awesome service, and profit sharing with local charities. In Alberta, you get to choose who you buy your energy from. If you choose Park Power, your money stays here. Plus, Park Power shares its profits with local non for profits that are working to make a difference in their communities. Shopping local is very important to Park Power's owner, Chris Kozowski, and we love local here at Alberta Podcast Network, so it's a great fit. Learn more at parkpower.ca. Okay, so we are back, and uh, Greg is going to share something with us for subject number four? Five? Wherever we are. Four? Four. Yeah, anyway, four. Who's, who's counting these who's days? Who's counting? Anyway? Yeah. <laughs> so I, was, uh, I wasn't asked, well, I was kind of told that to talk about head cheese. Ooh, a head bag. <laughs> um, so for a lot of people that don't know what head cheese is, it is not cheese whatsoever. Uh, it does not contain any dairy product except for maybe the animal that produces the dairy. So traditionally, it is known as what is uh, a terrine, which would be a, a meat or um, meats that are set into a gelatinous mold, uh, which was called aspic. Uh, aspic is made out of uh, gelatin that has been of like a reduced stock, so like a bone stock, beef, pork, whatever. It's just going to be greatly reduced to the point where when it cools, it looks like a very thick jello. Um, and it is not uh, always used with head. So traditionally, it was used with uh, either a uh, pig or a cow's head. Uh, and like you said to yourself, uh, lips are also one of like the main cuts, and that's just due to that uh, the cheeks being quite meaty and uh, having a nice like layer of fat in there. So when you cook mm-hmm. them properly, they are very, very delicious, and they are a prime cut. But everything else was kind of left there. And back in the day, peasants were hungry. They don't let anything go to waste. Uh, they What they did is they basically boiled it, cooked it down, a getting their um, their stock to make a, their aspic and then having the meat afterwards to put it in there. It was a great way to preserve it, uh, for one. So it, like, it lasted for quite a long time and was quite flavorful. So it was like one of those things where if you're poor or whatever, you weren't eating the best of foods, but this would be one of the foods that had a lot of flavor in it because it was something that was made over a long period of time and you were extracting like all that goodness that would have been left if you had just thrown it away uh modern day head cheese is not made with head um, you know it's kind of a weird thing it just pe- became popular <clears throat> just like most peasant foods like lobster and so on uh, and they're made they're kind of just made with like trimmings just like hot dogs so like if you have part of a pork shoulder you don't want to use all right perfect we'll put that in the, in the bin for for making some head cheese and and, and whatnot um, one thing that I found out that was really cool uh, researching head cheese is that in Alberta, we have a huge Ukrainian community here, um, and they have um, a delicacy called studenets, which is basically just like a, a braised meat that they set into a, a, like a beef or a pork gelatin. Um, not so popular amongst people that are probably not Ukrainian, but if you haven't had a chance to try it, I definitely, definitely recommend it. Hmm. What was it called again? Uh, studenets. Oh, okay. Yeah. Studenets, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, head cheese. It's it's not cheese, man. It's just a meaty deliciousness. Head cheese, not just for heads anymore. Yeah. Exactly. Have you had head cheese before? Uh, I have. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Charlie. Have you ever had had head cheese? I almost said, have you ever had had cheese? Have you ever had had cheese before? I no. don't remember. <laughs> I don't recall. It, it it it's kind of like my grandparents used to have it all the time. I don't know if they made it or not, but they it's like really thinly, kind of like sort of looks like jello and it has like little orange bits. And it like, literally looks like a, a jello tube with like hunks of meat in it. Right, right. Yeah, and it tastes as good as Greg just described it. Just a <laughs> yeah. tube full of hunks of meat. Before. I don't know if I've ever actually had it. Yeah. But see, like what we're talking about now is like a commercially made one, where one you would find it like a deli in a supermarket. Right. Um, tr- traditionally, it, it's not like that. Like it's going to be like a very thin layer, but with like all this fatty, rich, heavily seasoned, delicious meat. When it's, it's it's got that like I said it's got a layer of gel around it to help preserve it, right. but it also has like keeping that flavor in there as well. You know, and, like to them it was just like, why are we wasting this thing? Let's turn it into this meatloaf and eat it. Mm. And if you eat the head cheese, then you get all of the knowledge, right? Yeah. That's what I've been told. So uh, apparently, I've just been getting dumber. Yeah. Okay, well uh, that's going to take us to ad number two. Whoop. 
Hello and welcome. My name is Joshua. And I'm Grayson. And together we host Epic Podcast, Emergency Preparedness in Canada. On the show, we explore disasters and their management from a uniquely Canadian perspective. Whether it's our history. Most people in Halifax don't know what the cargo is. And then whammo, vessel explodes. Our society. So we can't really address disasters without looking at who has the decision-making power. Or our hazards. It's virtually impossible for us to provide any advance warning for a landscape tornado. We've got something for everyone because when it comes down to it, disasters are everyone's business. Visit our website at epicpodcast.ca, follow us on Twitter at epic underscore underscore podcast, or subscribe to the Emergency Preparedness in Canada podcast on your favorite app. All this and more on the next episode of Epic Podcast, current, relevant, Canadian. So subject number five, story time real quick. My wife and I were in Naha, Okinawa, and it was her birthday. So we decided to splurge, get a fancy meal. We'd been out to this really cool little dive bar on the beach the night before. And one of the locals uh, that we were hanging out with was like, oh, you got to try this like local community dish. It's great. Everybody loves it. And the dish is called champuru. And uh, so he's like, you got to He's like, repeat after me, champuru. And when I said it, like people that were sitting at the bar and like the bartender were like, yeah. And I'm like, what the? So they just love that. Somebody was coming and they were going to try this. So that night he did sit me down and explain to me exactly what was in it. But between glasses of snake whiskey, and that's true, it was a bottle of whiskey with a snake in it. uh, A few bottles of Orion, which is this really good Okinawa beer. Uh, and the fact that we were in a super loud karaoke hut, I sort of lost track of the details. And the next morning... My wife's like, what was that that we were going to have? And I'm like, I ah, champadu, I can't remember was in it. Let's just go get some. <clears throat> uh, anywho, <clears throat> the next day, we found the local restaurant that the, the locals had suggested. Got a nice bottle of awamori, which is kind of like sake and shochu with Thai rice and pineapple in it. It's really good. Um, and we ordered a romantic meal of champuru. And uh, basically what we got was this like plate. It was this big, beautiful stir fry, all these like fresh vegetables. And it's on the ocean. So everything just looked awesome. And the shocker was that there was clearly big, glistening, gloopy chunks of spam just interspersed throughout the meal. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, that's it's good. I'm, I kind of like spam. But I'm like, this is your this is your national thing. And they're like, yeah, champuru, man. It's spam. And, like, there was, when we looked around the restaurant, there was signs of, like, old vintage spam posters up on the wall from the 50s. And I'm like, okay. Like, it's a country with a lot of niches. Mm -hmm. But became very clear to us that Okinawa was, like, we just love spam. Hey, man. They're not the only ones that champion spam. Oh, we're going to get into it. That's what what this is all about. Yeah, that's right. Korea. (laughs) Yeah, they are. They're just loving the spam. So, this is the mystery of spam. How did it become a global phenomenon? Uh, It's more than a ridiculed mystery meat in a can, and it's certainly more than the adopted phrase for unwanted emails. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. Um, Okay, so years ago, early 1930s, the Great Depression... World War II brewing in Europe, and Jimmy Rogers singing about having tuberculosis. I'm going to put a little clip of that in. My good gal's trying to make a fool out of me. Lord, my gal the Hormel people came out with canned ham. They're like, hey, would you like some canned ham? Mm-hmm. And, and people were like, meh. And then like, okay. <laughs> and they relabeled it. They're like, they called it spiced ham. They're like, would you like some spiced ham? Uh, and people were like, meh. And uh, their big selling point was it was ham that you could keep in your cupboard. You didn't have to put it in the fridge and you didn't have to worry about it going bad. So yay, yay ham. Yay ham in a can. Preserved. Love uh, it. Problem was the market was being flooded with canned ham. And at the time, the term canned ham didn't really make it like stick out in any way. Like they're like, hey, would you like some canned ham? Like it'd be like. We have some canned beer. Would you like some canned beer? <laughs> um, so it didn't make it stick out anyway. So the company decided to hold a little contest. And uh, this is in the 30s. So this is actually quite a bit of money. They offered $100 to anyone who could come up with a catchy name for the product. Uh, the logic at the time was simple enough. They were like, we want to generate generate a little bit of buzz in the local media and maybe get some creative juices flowing. So the winner, and I know this guy's name, Ken Dainu or Dagno, I don't know how you say his name. Uh, he suggested they call it spam. And uh, I'm going to save what that, what his, his rationale behind that. So he's like, how about spam? And they're like, oh, okay. We have and a winner. They, they called it spam. Boom. The legend was born. The name clicked. The product became a hot seller. In the early 1940s, the company also took the risk of creating their own jingle, which is a market first, allegedly, uh, for the product. 
So the words were spam, 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 spam. Hormel's numerical meat in a can tastes fine, saves time. If you want something grand, ask for spam. I Something think that like was that. perfect, yeah. yeah. Spam, spam, spam. <laughs> uh, Americans bought into this, and then the big money rolled in. The U.S. military entered World War II, and the government suddenly had a few options for making sure that soldiers had easy rations that they could carry with them without worrying about spoilage. Everybody loved spam. It was cheaper than what they'd been previously buying, and everyone's like, it tastes better. So the war effort became fueled in part by spam. So between 1942 and 1945... Over 150 million pounds of spam was sent overseas to the soldiers fighting in World War II. And that's actually just the Americans. We'll get back to that in a second. But that was just the American soldiers. Amazingly, some say it's a bit too convenient. But the wartime efforts on rationing in the U.S. also made a big difference. So things like rubber, metal, and foods were being held back for the war effort. But spam, for some reason, continued to be widely available and was fast becoming the favorite meal for families. So they're like, there's no ration on spam. You can have as much as you like. And uh, at the same time, due to a corporate relationship independent of the U.S. government with the British and Russian governments, the Hormel company supplied tons of spam to allied efforts. So when rebuilding places that had been ravaged by war, the Hormel company, and sometimes they did this with the U.S., they would like send boatloads of spam to like countries and places that have been ravaged. So places like Okinawa, uh, suddenly saved by boatloads of spam, and it gained a huge cultural significance. Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev was quoted as saying, I'm going to try out my Russian voice here, we haven't done this in a while. <laughs> Without spam, we wouldn't have been able to feed the army. Is that Russian? That sounded more German, but I'll, we'll go with it. <laughs> without, without spam, without the spam, we wouldn't, without the spam, we wouldn't be able to feed the armies. Andrew, that is the worst Russian accent I have ever heard. The quote in a real Russian accent is, "Without spam, we would not have been able to feed our army." Learn how to do it right. Or fuck off. Um, so spam, which was nicknamed the Hawaiian steak. Charlie, did you have some Hawaiian steak when you were in Hawaii? Oh, musubis. <laughs> some spam and eggs. Oh uh, no, a musubi is a uh, is a slab of spam, uh, sometimes with teriyaki or sometimes with other sauces, and um, uh, some rice, and then it's wrapped up like. Um, Sushi. It's sushi rice. Oh, it's like a big sushi roll. But with yeah, seaweed. like an onigiri. Uh, seaweed. And it's amazing. Oh, dude. I'm into the it. The best. Actually, that's in, in, in like two things here. We're going to talk about something that sounds just like what you're talking about. So this is Spam, nicknamed the Hawaiian steak, sold in large chain restaurants like Burger King across Hawaii and then in islands across the, the Pacific like Guam and, uh, and the Philippines. So one of the biggest markets for the product continues to be South Korea. And due to a scarcity of fish and an abundance of spam, again, because they were sending it all over, uh, during the Korean War, traditional dishes like kimbap had the fish replaced with spam, and it continues to be served this way. So that'd be like one of those things where it's like spam, rice, seaweed, yeah. wrap mm -hmm. it up and have at her. Why you can go and get them <clears throat> at, like you would go and buy a taquito. Pretty much, yeah. Except yeah. It's the best. You can get them with eggs in it for breakfast. Just like oh. taquitos. Just like taquitos. <laughs> <laughs> taquitos. Just like taquitos. Uh, now, this import is more culturally revered, spam again, than institutions like KFC and Coca-Cola because of this. So I, I find that incredible myself, wow. that spam is like a bigger cultural influence than Coca-Cola. I can mm. see that, though. Yeah. Yeah. You can't. I don't know. I've never tried to live on Coca-Cola. We'll give it a shot. <laughs> <laughs> Coke and Spam. What could go wrong? There is a Spam Museum in Minnesota. Uh, there's the Spam Jam in Hawaii. Uh, there's the musical Spam A Lot from Monty Python. And, of course, Weird Al's take on R.E.M.'s song Stand, which he <laughs> retitled Spam. Yeah. Which was uh, no. in the original. <laughs> <laughs> no, just putting that out there. Uh, quick editor's note. Hey, Andy, you forgot to tell us what spam stands for, bud. Oh, hi. Sorry. <laughs> hey there. Hi. I, uh, I, sorry, I forgot to, uh, include the, uh, definition of spam. Hi, sorry. So, turns out the Ken 
Dagnu, Dainu, I, <laughs> uh, he, the secret was an acronym for shoulder of pork and ham. Uh, and then Dagnu, Dainu, I don't know. He later clarified it was actually the combination of spiced ham. So either way, <laughs> either, either way we get spam. Yeah, uh, good times. Okay, <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll see you soon. You take, you take care. Okay, all right, take her easy. Really quick, just to wrap things up, uh, this isn't about spam, but here's a little joke for you guys. What happened when the frog left his car in the parking space? Hmm. It got towed away. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Okay. That's, not a, that's not a lunch meat, though. Trip, though. No, no that's meat not a lunch meat. I couldn't find it was any good. lunch meat it was jokes. Good, yeah. It was good. It was good. So in lieu of opinion time, I just have real quick questions for you guys. Number one, Charlie, are you a mayo guy? Yes. Okay. Would you be okay if mayo was like peanut butter and came either smooth or crunchy? Crunchy mayo? I don't know if I can get behind that. Okay. All right. However, in Belgium, they've got all sorts of different mayos. They've got like mayo mixed with hot sauces and all things like that. So depends what the crunchy. What's the crunchy part? I believe they call it aioli. Mayoli. Mayo. <laughs> uh, Greg, are you a mayo guy? Oh, hell yeah. Okay. Do you think it's okay that people are putting out the condiment called uh, mayo chup? That's like ketchup and mayonnaise put together all for you in one thing as if you're no, not five years old yeah, and you can't mix them together yourself. I also, it isn't, isn't like the word mayo chup like a, a, a curse word or something means something bad in some language. It's like, it's apparently like some really insensitive term. I think it's Cree. Is it Cree? And they're like, okay. they're like, you shouldn't say that. Cause that's like a real bad. Yeah. It's almost like an, it's an insult. Uh, but anyway, like how lazy are you that you can't put mayo and, ke- and mustard or sorry, when you buy ketchup that. and mayo on the same goddamn thing you're going to eat and That's let it mix itself? It's like mm-hmm. peanut now. butter and jelly swirl. It makes oh, it. Come but on. That, that was actually I would I would appreciate that more than I would the mayo and ketchup. Yeah. I see. Normally, I would say you're absolutely right. Like, I, I don't need I don't need a third party telling me how much ketchup and how much mayo I, I get in my whatever. Yeah, it depends but on how I feel. The other day. Uh, we're having burgers. Normally, if I'm going to have a burger at home, I'm like a little bit of mayo, a little bit of mustard, a little bit of relish, and like a tomato, some lettuce, you know, done. And we didn't have any mayo. We didn't have any uh, relish. And I got a jar of tartar sauce. And I'm like, well, that's just basically mayo and relish. Put the tartar sauce on my, not a fish burger, on my regular burger. And it was amazing. And I'm like, okay, maybe there's something to this uh, ketchup mayo thing. Like they've got the ratio down. I'm not saying it's a good idea, but maybe there's something to the idea of that, you know, tastes and also tartar sauce in your burger. Boom. Like, absolutely. See, but you're basically, you're taking like five or six ingredients that you would already put on your burger and putting them into a sauce. Just like ketchup and mayo, though. It's the same. Yeah. No, no it's not the same. It's different. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Tartar sauce is more advanced. No, tartar, like, tartar sauce in itself is something different. But like mayo and ketchup, like who's to say, like, I don't want 50-50. Maybe I want 60-40. Totally. You know? And I, I get that. And a previous whereas couple in, days whereas ago, what, I with, with, with tartar you. sauce, I'm looking at for it to be tangy pickle and give me some, some mayo. You know, I'm, It's got to have tang. Got to have a mayo consistency. That's it. But I'm not looking for 60% pickle, 20% this. Yeah, it's, it's all about the ratio, isn't it? It's all about the ratios, bud. No, I can agree with that. Uh, oh, oh, sorry, the last question here I have for you guys uh, is um, we talked about hot dogs. Uh, I know my own feelings on it, but uh, do you guys consider hot dogs lunch meats? I got one better. Is a hot dog a sandwich? Oh, boy. And then they were no longer friends. <laughs> yeah, no. That's all that logic. Like, oh, is cereal soup? Well, like, it, no, no, no. But if you were just... Uh, Huh. If you think that a hot dog is a lunch meat, then you got to think a hot dog is a sandwich. I'm okay with a hot dog being a sandwich. It's in the it's in the umbrella term. A hot dog being a lunch meat, I'm like, yep, absolutely. But I know people that would be like, a hot dog is not just, lunch meat. It's just a tube as opposed to... It's a tiny tube instead flat. of a chub. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a loaf instead of a sausage, just a little... Same thing. It's, it's a little loaf. Different, little different loaf. Uh, meat delivery system. <laughs> <laughs> I think we could just agree that hot dogs are amazing. Um and I've been craving a Costco hot dog for so long. Ooh, oh, nice and garlicky. Yeah, I know. Not not the best for you, but whatever. We're all adults. Who cares, man? Yeah. Buck 99? Not the best for you. Do you see the world we're living in with 2020 <laughs> apocalypse bingo? Yeah. You going to worry about a hot dog? Apocalypse There's worth. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm saying go for it. You know, if you're at Costco, yeah. That's right. Wasn't that a, a meaty way to meet for the meat places in our hearts thank you for stopping by and please feel free to rate review subscribe tell a friend tell your neighbor tell your foes 
spread the good word, like ketchup and mayonnaise on the cone that you're going to put your hamburger in. You can check out all of our past casts and social media stuff at It's a Conspiracy Podcast. And we will be back soon with the beginning of season three. Okay. So we're almost at the Ooh, end of, uh, I almost don't want to say it, but we're almost. Just yep. don't say it. We're yep, almost okay, there. Say it. We're almost there. We're almost no, there. We'll, just, we'll just say that. So. Yep. <laughs> So, yeah, the freedom is ending and uh, the, the pain is about to begin. So, we need um, a Costco hot dog. Yeah, actually, my uh, my daughter, uh, I think it was last, her, no, two years ago, she's like, we're like, where do you want to have your birthday party? And she's like, I want to go to Costco. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I thought that was so funny. <laughs> so That's like, amazing. That is so great. Cause, and she loves it. Like, we stop there and, you know, but like, everybody gets ice cream, everybody gets a hot dog. Like, it makes sense. Point. I'm like, that is That's so funny. Perfect. Yeah. Man. You got, you got some good kids there. But. Yeah. Well, in that regard. Ugh. Okay, well, thanks again for uh, for listening, and take care. Bye. See ya. Those are chock full of heady goodness. <laughs> 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 <laughs>